Hare Krishna. Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, today I will speak on the topic of so I'll speak on the topic of how God helps us when we help ourselves. And within that I'll talk broadly three parts. That what is the help that we need in life? Then who, who is the God that helps us? And how does he help us? So we all have many desires that we want to fulfill. We want to buy something, we want to achieve something. Basically, our desires can be classified into two broad categories. We want possessions and we want positions. So positions. I want to own this, I want to own this. Positions is in the social hierarchy. We want to rise higher and higher. Now, even a little conduct of life helps us recognize that it's not always in our power to fulfill our desires. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, we start thinking, is there something higher? And is, is that something higher, whatever it is, will that help me? So when we recognize that what we want, our performance matters to get it. But our performance is not all that matters. Then we start thinking of ways in which we can please whatever unknown is out there so that our life can go on well, so that our desires can be fulfilled. And it is when usually what we want is not easily achievable. That is when we start thinking, what do I do now? I need help of someone more poor. Now we may literally look at some other human beings, some other people who are more powerful. But some things are just beyond human control. So generally, we might have some cultural conception of God. But in a practical sense, we turn towards God when we feel a need to do something that is not in our power to do. About for 20 years, I have been a brahmachari in India and I used to live in a temple and after a few years, I, I started observing that April and May were the months of devotion. Now, why, what do I mean by that? That right next to our temple in Pune, where I was staying, there was a school. And the school children would never come to the temple except in April and May. What was happening in April and May? Exams. So <laughs> they wanted to, oh God, please pass me, help me pass this exam. So it was April and May were the times when people were uh, come, these kids were coming to the temples. So now when they feel I have to get something which is not in my power to get, that's when we seek help of someone higher. So that, that's the beginning of turning towards God. We, even if we have some cultural conception in an existential practical sense, we feel the need for God and we have to do something which we are not able to do. And then at that time, once we start connecting, start seeking help from that unknown, gradually we start thinking, who, who is that unknown or what is that unknown? When I was one, some of you may notice that I require crutches for walking. So when I was one, I got polio. Actually, it was that my parents had given me the polio vaccine, but somehow it was a it was a remote town and the medical facilities were not very good, and the doctor did not keep the vaccine properly. So the vaccine dosage got multiplied somehow, and the vaccine instead of preventing the polio gave me the polio. So, since then I couldn't walk properly. But then my parents, uh, when my relatives and friends would come, they would say that I was good at studies uh, somehow. So my parents would talk and they would say, whatever God has taken in physical ability 
God has provided him in intellectual ability. So at that time, I remember thinking, who is this mysterious being God? He can give anything and take anything. What is all this? That is why I started thinking about it. And then, over a period of time, see, initially our interest is not in God per se. It is in what God will give me. So that is the beginning of the religious instinct. But to go from religion to spirituality, to go from religion to a higher level of consciousness means the person's focus shifts from what God gives me to who God is. And then we want to understand that. That is the time when our spiritual evolution progresses much higher. So all over the world, there are many different theistic traditions and they all talk about God. Now when the Britishers and the European colonialists came to India, they found India extremely bewildered. There was one British thinker, he said that, if there were a, if we had a competition in religious wealth india would be the millionaire why because india had a million gods other traditions have one god there are million gods so initially they thought the europeans thought that actually, they had this idea of monotheism and polytheism have you heard these words what is monotheism it is one God. Mono is one. Theism is God. And polytheism is many gods. So they had the, the Christian tradition, basically the Abrahamic religions, where they have Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all come from all of the same roots. So they have the idea there is one God. That's monotheism. And before that, in the, the Greco-Roman tradition, where they had polytheism, many gods. So they had, that was their conception of the worship of many gods. And when they came to India, they thought Indians are also polytheistic. But after some time, as they looked deeper, they noticed something very peculiar. That actually, the attributes of God, see in polytheism, the idea was that, that each god has his or her own turf. And these gods are fighting among each other. And it was if this god has this territory, that god has that territory, that god has that territory. But then they found that in the Indian tradition, if you consider the Bhagavad Gita, if you consider many of the core texts, the description of God was actually very similar to the description of God in terms of characteristics, what was given in the Abrahamic tradition. That means. When God is described in the Bhagavad Gita, he is described as being all powerful, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. And the Bible, for example, says, I am the Alpha and Omega of all things. And the Bhagavad Gita says, Akshanam Akarosmi, Amadishya Mantyamcha Bhutana Mantyamcha. That I am the beginning and end of all things. And I am the middle also. So, in terms of characteristics, they found that. The characteristics of God that were described in the Indian Dharmic traditions were the characteristics of a monotheistic deity, not a polytheistic deity. Polytheism means each God has his own jurisdiction. So then it was very confusing. What is going on? So actually, there are certain classifications which are derived from certain traditions. And those classifications may not apply in other traditions. Why is that? Because if, say, for example, if we are eating food, we can ask, this is, this is sweet, this is sour. But if we come to a room and we want to measure the room, is the room sweet or sour? Yeah, rooms are not sweet or sour. Maybe something that it may, be, it may be spelling in a particular way. But uh, nobody comes to taste a room. Then we say, okay, is it spacious? Is it cramped? 
Is it wind? Is it sunlight? We look at different characteristics. So the Vedic conception, the Dharmic conception of God is very different. And the best way to describe it, it's neither monotheism nor polytheism. It's actually what you can call as polymorphic monotheism. Polymorphic monotheism. There is one God, but polymorph, many, many forms. So, ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti. The Rig Veda says that there is one absolute truth, but the sages know that absolute truth many different names. So, polymorphic monotheism. And it's not just monotheism. See, in the Judeo Christian tradition, God is envisioned as the masculine being. God is always referred to as He. But in the Dharmic tradition, God is not just a single person. God is always a divine couple. We have Sita Ram, we have Radha Krishna, we have Lakshmi Narayan. It's always a divine couple. And both of them are considered divine. Both of them are considered worshipable. So if you want to make a further classification, it's actually polymorphic by monotheism. There's one God who manifests as a divine couple and then there are multiple divine couples like that. So, it's a much more intricate conception of God. And within this, there is an understanding that that one divinity manifests at multiple levels to attract different kinds of people at different levels. So, this is another major difference. In the Bible, for example, it is said, your God is a jealous God. Thou shall not bow down to any other God except your God. And there is always a contrast between there is one true God and there are many false gods. And right from the Old Testament down to the Quran, there are descriptions wherever any religious king conquers a particular place, the first thing he will go is destroy all the false gods. So that the, the, their idea is that the glory of the true God will be established. But this dichotomy between the true God and the false gods, that is not there in the Dharmic tradition. The idea is that there is one God and he is not jealous. He does not worship anyone except him. God is not jealous. God is zealous. He is zealous. He is eager. He is industrious so that our welfare can be sought. And the idea over there is that each one of us is an individual. And not everyone will be attracted with the same ideas. Then the Bhagavad Gita Krishna tells this idea of polymorphic monotheism. Yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta shraddayar chitam ichchati tasya chalam shraddham tam eva vidham yaham. So yo yo yam yam tanum bhakta whatever form someone desires to worship. Krishna says, I make their faith strong. Shraddhayar chitam ichhati the desire to worship tasya achalam shraddham I give them that faith. Tam eva vidham yaham and then what happens by that? Shraddhaya shraddhaya yuktas tasya radhanam ehate labhate chitataha kaman mayaiva vihitan hitan this is 721-23 in the Bhagavad Gita so 722 now Krishna says that with that faith, I, I give this faith, whichever form you want to worship, I give you that faith and then you worship that form. And then you may get some results. Krishna is saying, I am giving those results. So, Mike is very humble. I think it's permanent. Maybe we can reduce this. I think it's in the middle of the So, so it said that here that it is God. Okay, so that you can say there is God with a capital G. And there are gods with a small g. And all of them are one continuous hierarchy. It is not that the god with the capital G is competing with the gods with a small g. 
there is one God and there are multiple levels of manifestation. So I'll explain with a story this or rather adaptation of a particular story. In the biblical tradition, there is a story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son is, do any of you know the story? Okay, some of you. So this is that there is a very wealthy landlord and he has two sons. And as one of the sons comes, the younger son comes of age, he says, Father, give me my inheritance. I want to go and live on my own. He says, no, no, you cannot live on me. Stay with me. Whatever you want, I'll provide you. He says, no, give me my inheritance. And then he takes it and he goes. And usually, you know, there are two kinds of friends we may have. There are some friends who take us for lunch. And there are, there are some friends who take away our lunch. <laughs> so generally most people struggle to earn money and feel if I only I have more money it will be so, so much good but actually money it is it is difficult to earn it but it is even more difficult to use it and for somebody to have the ability to earn money Without the maturity to use money, that is a recipe for disaster. Imagine if somebody is just a teenager and they just they started exploring life and they're exploring uh, drugs. And at that time, some of the grandmother, they get a big inheritance. It's the worst thing that can happen to them. So the ability to earn money is important. It's valuable. But even more valuable is the maturity to use money. And this is for he has got so much money and he falls into a bad crowd. And they start using his money, squandering it, partying, and he soon ends up losing all his money. And what happens when he loses his money? All his friends are also lost. Nobody is. And now he has defiantly left his father what to do now. He starts looking at handling some jobs and starts working with some other landlord. And that landlord exploits him and gives him barely the same food that is the animals are being fed. Then you feed the pigs and whatever food remains you eat. Can I do that? You know, if you don't get lost. Now he's living like that over there. He starts thinking, what do I do? So when I, mean, I was my father, things were so much better. Maybe I should go back. And I said, no, 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 I rejected him. I squandered his wealth. Will he accept me? I cannot go back. And on one particular day, things are so terrible. And he's feeding his pigs. Some of the pigs bite his hands and he's in immense pain. Now, even if my father accepts me as a servant, he treats his servants better than what I'm being treated, treated over here. So let me go back. And when he goes back, he's apprehensive. But his parent, his father, with great joy welcomes him and celebrates that my lost son has come back. So this is a metaphor which is used to tell how much is the love of God for us. But even if we turn away from him, he doesn't abandon us. He doesn't reject us. When we want to turn toward him, he's always there waiting for us. Now, yes, this is at one level a revelation of the love of God. The Dharmic tradition says that Actually, God's love for us is much greater. It's not just that he welcomes us when we turn back and return to him. Rather, he works to get us come back. And what is the way he works? That is, say suppose this father is a landlord or a big kid is a king. Now the son has had a quarrel with the father. So that's why now the father even goes and calls the son back. Because he has a quarrel and his quarrel will not come back. So what the father does is that the father sends some other landlord who is like his employee, subordinate to him. He says, you go and meet him, you talk with him. And then you employ him. Now if there is a king, that is why the father is a king and under that there is a landlord. So this landlord goes to his boy and the boy is lost boy. Prodigal is one who wastes things very much. So he's a wasteful boy. He says, what are you doing? He says, you work for me. I'll pay you. He says, okay. 
Oh, okay, I'll pay you more than what you It starts working. Now what has happened? This boy has left the father's kingdom. But still, he is now connected with someone who is connected with his father. He is not yet back in the kingdom. But he is back indirectly with his father's kingdom. And then, and then this boy says, suppose the boy wants to be, wants to take up employment. Normally, if you want to work with someone, we want to know what are their, their credentials. Just that they want to know our credentials. We want to know, I work for this company and after six months, this company goes bust. And my career will also be disrupted. So is this company having a good track record? So now for this purpose, to boost the credentials of this landlord, the, the king gives him a lot of wealth. This, this power, that power, the you are a really big person. And then on seeing this, what happens? This boy develops faith. Oh yeah, he's a big person. Let me, let me take up his take work for him. And while he's working for him like that, at that time, now he gets salary. So where is the salary coming from? To the king. To the king who is giving this salary. So what is happening by this, the king is reconnecting with the son. And then eventually, gradually may I ask, okay, this minister, I work for him. So what do you do? And say, oh, you know, I work for the king. Oh, really? Which king? For that king. I say, no, you work for that king. And he says, maybe I should go back to that king. So what is happening here? A bridge is being built. So in the Vedic tradition, I started by talking about how there is this polymorphic monotheism. So there is the idea that there is one, they talk about God in the capital G and God in the small g. There is one God, whom Sanskrit is called as Bhagavan. And there are many other gods who are called as Devatas and Devis. And they are all one continuity. And the purpose of that continuity is to elevate everyone. So some people, they may just directly be attracted to God, to Bhagwan, and they connect with Him. But those who cannot, for whatever reason, then it's not that my way or the highway. Not like that. There are some religions who say that you worship our God or you are going to go to hell. And some extremists within that religion say, not only are you going to go to hell, we will help you get there faster. <laughs> But that is not the idea over here. There's no exclusivism. It's inclusivism. Inclusivism means, okay, if you cannot connect over here, connect over here. If cannot connect over here, connect over there. So this way, what is here? There is, a, there is a continuity and there is facility to connect at one's own level. So we see right now the Durga Puja is going on. And this culminates, the last day is Dasera. And Dashera is the celebration. So each of these festivals in the Indian tradition, they have multiple significances. And the idea is all these are meant to work together to elevate different people to different levels. So Durga, the word Durga has many, many meanings. One of the means is Durga. Durga is a fortress. And one who is the guardian of the fortress. So I was in Australia and I was asked a question. If God is good, then why are the good choices so few and the bad choices so many? Isn't it? See, if I want to do bad, there are hundreds of bad things I can do. But good things, the good choices are so few, the bad choices are so many. So I replied, that's how it is in any multiple choice exam. <laughs> 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 Any multiple choice exam, there are will be four wrong choices. <laughs> so, and only one right choice. Now, if everything were functioning only on probability, you could say you could sue the teacher. You, know, you, you, you expect me to get 40% marks, but the probability of my taking the right answer is only 20%. So you rig this paper so I'll fail. I'll sue you for this. Now because the choice is not meant to be made only on probability. The choice is meant to be based on education, on knowledge. 
But similarly in the world, we have many choices. And the idea is God from within our hearts as the Paramatma and from outside as the Guru Sadhu Shastra, as the saintly teachers, as the spiritual master and the sacred books of wisdom. Through all this, we are given education of what choice to make. And normally if you have multiple choice exam, it's like one answer is right and all the others are wrong. But in life's exam, it is not that simple. So there are degrees of rightness and there are degrees of wrongness. So some can be totally wrong. Some can be perfectly right and some can be nearly right. So it's not that simple that one right and all wrong. But it's degrees of rightness and wrongness. So overall, uh, what happens is, I talk. I said I'll talk about the topic of how God helps those who help themselves. So the first point I spoke is, we all realize that sometime I need help. The second point I spoke was, well, who is the one who helps us? So the Dharmic traditions reveal a sophisticated conception of a God who manifests at multiple levels. And now how does God help us? So I talked about how there is a king, there is a king and the, the king wants his lost son to come back to him straight. But if the king is the son is not ready to come back, then the king says, okay, at least work with my minister, work with my landlord, and he will take care of you. So similarly, God offers us many, many agents through which we can be helped. And the way, the best way we can help ourselves is by seeking God for God's sake. Not seeking God for the gifts that God gives us. Why is that? Because the nature of the world is that whatever things we have, if we consider all of us, there are some things which we have and many things which we don't have. Say this is the box of what I have, box of what I don't have. Most of us think success means to move things from the box that I don't have to the box that I have. Oh, I have this car, but I don't have a bigger car. I have this house, but I don't have a bigger house. So what happens? The more things we move from the, the things I don't have to the things I have, we think I'm becoming successful. Now, yes, we all need things in life and we can seek them. But the problem here is that how many possessions we have is not as important as as what a disposition we have. No matter, we may have 100 things with us, but if our mind is habituated to looking at what we don't have, then we will never be happy. So to be happy is possible, but we want to be happier than others. And that is impossible. Because there will always be someone who will have more than what we have. And when that happens, we feel, why? I want more, I want more. And this way, if we think the success in my life is getting more and more things, then we will set ourselves for perpetual dissatisfaction. Suppose, after this program, we have some prasad. Well, don't suppose Prasad is there. <laughs> but suppose there is a special kind of menu where every one of you in your plate, every one of us in our plates will have a separate dessert. Someone has gulab jamun, somebody has halwa, somebody has malpoa, somebody has son papri, somebody has baklava, somebody has uh, something else. Now, I have a dessert in my plate. But instead of eating it, if I start looking, what is in his plate? And then what is in her plate? And then what is in her plate? What is his plate? What will happen? I won't even be able to taste what I have in my plate. Isn't it? So, that is the predicament of us in today's world. Especially today with the tech connected, interconnectedness through technology. Maybe in the past, if people wanted to buy something or they were craving for something, I have this, but they could just go and so do what is called window shopping. Just look at all the things that are there in the shop. But 
But now through the internet we can do window shopping all over the world, and that just increases our dissatisfaction. So we all need things in life, but there is a difference between what we live with and what we live for. What we live with are the resources, and they're important. I suppose you saw your neighbor rushing out of their home and going out in the car. So where are you going? He says, "I'm going to the gas station to put gas in my car." Okay. But after that, where are you going? He says, "After that, I'll go to the next gas station and put gas." No, but after that, where will you go? Yeah, I'll go to the next gas station. But where are you going? He says, "I'm I'm, I'm going to gas station." Yeah, that's strange. You know, gas is what we drive with. It's not what we drive for. <laughs> so similarly, for all of us, we all need some amount of wealth. We all need some amount of uh, worldly possessions. But that is what we live with, not what we live for. So there is a difference between the resources for living and the purpose of living. So now most people go to God because they feel that like there are some resources I want and I don't have those resources. So if God provides me those resources, He is so good. And yes, God can provide us those resources also. But God's greatest gift is not to provide us the resources for living, but to provide us the purpose for living. And ultimate purpose for living is that. We want to connect with the one who is all attractive, who is all powerful, who is all loving, and the bhakti tradition reveals a vision of God who is supremely attractive. And in loving God, it's described. I talked about seven twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. Just one verse before that, in seven nineteen, in the Bhagavad Gita, it is said, "Bahu nam janmana vante, jnana van mam prapadite." वासुदेव सर्वविति समात्मा सुदुर्लभः सो बहुनाम जन्मना मन्ते इट विल टेक मेनी मेनी लाइफ टाइम्स टू कम टू दिस अंडरस्टैंडिंग व्हाट इज दैट अंडरस्टैंडिंग ज्ञानवान वन बिकम्स नॉलेजेबल मां प्रपद्यते दैट पर्सन सरेंडर्स टू गॉड व्हाई अंडरस्टैंडिंग वासुदेव सर्वविति दैट व्हाटएवर आई व्हाटएवर आई वांट the embodiment and fulfillment of all my desires is ultimately in god sa mahatma sudurlabh the great soul who desires like this is very very rare so i said no matter how many things we have if our disposition is to look at the things we don't we don't have we will forever be dissatisfied but if we learn to direct our desires towards god then that purifies our desires and satisfies our heart that doesn't mean that we we don't have possessions or we don't care for possessions but we don't think of the possessions as the purpose of life we don't think of the possessions as our primary source of happiness and that way when we connect with krishna when we connect with the supreme connect with the divine connect with krishna at that time we experience the supreme truth यम अल्टिमेट We are, we feel contentment with that. Then you can think in your life, whatever are your dreams. If you fulfill those dreams, can you say after I get it, there's nothing more I want? Whatever goals we have, but none of the goals we can say this. I get that I want something more, something more, something more. So it will be a perpetual dissatisfaction. And then, but this is not the case if you become absorbed in the Lord, in love, and then. It says, also if we are situated like this, Guru na pi na vichalye the. That even if distress comes in our life, distress won't disturb us. Distress will not disturb us. 
So once we develop this understanding that God is the source of all good, and the various good things are valuable, but the source of all good things, God is the supreme valuable. But all the things of this world can give us some pleasure. So I'll conclude with one example, and then if we have some questions, we can discuss that God is is like a five billion dollar treasure, and the things of this world. Various things they may be. They are like five dollar, five dollar notes, five dollar treasures. For somebody who has nothing, well, five dollars are very valuable. But if somebody is on the path where they can get to five million dollars, and while moving toward five dollar million dollars, this is the path I'm going along, and I'm here, and I see along the road there's a five dollar bill over there. Hey, let me go and get it. And I go toward it, and the bill flies away. And I fly, and I run after it. I run after it, and in chasing that five dollar bill, I end up losing the five billion dollar treasure. I want this, but I lose something much bigger. Conversely, I'm walking along this road, and I have a five dollar bill in my pocket. Some some thief comes and just puts it in my pocket and pulls that five dollar. I start chasing them. I'm running, run, 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 and I'm far away, and I forget this path. So in our life, there will always be ups and downs. Sometimes things will go right, sometimes things will go wrong. But these ups and downs are like five dollar gains or five dollar losses. They are important if you can avoid the loss, if you can procure the gain, that is good. But in seeking that, we can't afford to get distracted from life's ultimate purpose. That is like a five million dollar gain. The Bhagavad Gita says that if we if if, the, if we become focused on the divine. The prarishet priyam prapya nodvijet prapya cha priyam sthirapudhir asamudho brahma vid brahma nistita ha. That don't be elated when there is pleasure, and don't be dejected when there is pain, because these will come and go. But how can I tolerate them? Brahma vid, recognize that you are a spiritual being, that you are connected to the supreme spiritual reality. Each one of us is meant for something much bigger. The children play with toys, and if the toys break, they cry. Now, if an adult starts playing with toys and starts crying, the, the toys break. They grow up. Just as we outgrow our toys, as we grow up physically, similarly, we outgrow our obsession with material things as we grow up spiritually. And then, oh, this sometimes this happens. We lose sometimes, we gain sometimes, but there's no need to get too disturbed by this. Let me say spiritually correct. And if we do this, this is the best way we can help ourselves, because life will always bring some ups and downs. God does not promise us a stormless sea. Just because even if we become devoted, then we are in a the sea. The world is called Baba Sagar. When the sea storms will come. God doesn't promise a stormless sea, but God provides a unsinkable ship. That unsinkable ship is the ship of bhakti. When we connect with the divine with devotion, then that connection gives us stability, and that stability will be the basis by which we can go through even the toughest of life storms. And we can grow internally in more and more contentment, in more and more strength, ultimately in more and more love for the Lord. That is the path to supreme satisfaction. And when we are connected in this way with Krishna, with the Lord, we will eventually realize that God can give us many blessings, but God is God's greatest blessing. That if we have the Lord with us. Then, even if we are nothing else, it doesn't matter. In the Mahabharat war, Krishna, Arjuna, and Duryodhan both went to choose. And Duryodhan had this material vision. He, he was very happy when he got all of the army of Narayana. And Arjuna was happy he got just Narayana. And Duryodhan thought Arjuna is a fool. Now, in the war, Arjuna Krishna said, "I will not fight." I'll be a non-combatant. He said, "What is the use? One person and that to non-combatant? You're the sentimental fool." 
But if you study the Mahabharata, what happened? Krishna was there as the counselor. Krishna was there as the guide. In all the critical battles, Krishna guided Arjuna to victory. So, just as Krishna's role was in the Mahabharata war, God's role is in our life. God may not directly be visible. God may not directly act. But for one who chooses God, for one who devotes themselves to God, God will guide from within. No matter how big dangers, how big challenges come, if we are connected with God, then we will find within us the strength to face those challenges. There will be life may send big problems in our life, in our way, but greater than the world's problems is God. Greater than the world's power to hurt is God's power to heal. And if you turn towards God, you will always stay protected, stay strengthened and ultimately we will attain life's perfection. We will attain the end of our life, the eternal kingdom of God where we will live forever in love for him, with him and with a wonderful community of pure souls. That is life's supreme perfection. So I'll summarize what I spoke today and then if you have any questions, we can discuss briefly. So I spoke on this topic today of uh, God helps though, how God helps those who help themselves. So I talked in three parts. First was, how do we need help? So whenever we try to fulfill our desires, soon we realize fulfilling my desires requires many things beyond my control to work right. And then we start thinking, maybe there is someone up there who is controlling those things and I can seek the help of that, that being. That's how it's a preliminary awakening of God consciousness. And then gradually as we move forward, we start thinking, who is that being? What is that reality? And then I talk about in the Abrahamic traditions, there is the idea that there is one God and we have to subordinate themselves to him, ourselves to him. And they had the idea that other traditions have many gods who are competing with each other. But the Dharmic traditions have the idea of not monotheism or polytheism, but polymorphic monotheism. There is one God who manifests at multiple levels for one purpose. So there is God with a capital G and there are gods with a small g. That's the idea of the example of the prodigal son talks about how God loves us so much that even if we give up God and go away, when we come back, God welcomes us. But the Bhakti tradition, the Dharmic traditions tell us that not only does God welcome us when we come back, but God works to get us back. And that is through intermediaries. So just as the king, we send the son of daughter to come back to him, the king sends a minister and the landlord. You work with him. That's how you are indirectly connected with him. And gradually by working for him, you will come to him. So similarly, there is one God, but he has many devatas, Bhagwan and devatas. And those who can devote themselves to the Bhagwan, they are special, they are Mahatmas. But those who can't, it's not that they are rejected, not one way or the highway. They are also connected. And they are connected with, they can connect with devatas. And it is, it is Bhagwan, it is Krishna himself who gives the the power to the devatas by which they can inspire faith among their followers, among their worshippers, and it is he who gives them the gifts which they get from the worship of the devatas. Just like the king provides everything to the minister, which the minister provides to the employees. And this whole multi-level conception of God is having one purpose, to connect us with the ultimate reality. And then how do we connect with that? That I the last part. How do we help ourselves? We help ourselves by choosing God rather than the gifts coming from God. If we choose only the gifts coming from God, the problem is no matter how much we have, our mind will look at what we don't have and keep us dissatisfied. So what we live with is not what we live for. God will give us the resources to live with. But most important, the purpose to live for. And that purpose is ultimately attraction to him, absorption in him. Because he is like the $5 billion. And everything in the world is like $5. So the more we connect with the $5 billion treasure, then the $5, five, five losses or gains don't trouble us so much. So life will send many storms in our way. That is, the $5 things will get lost. And if if we have no vision for the $5 million, the $5 loss will seem like a huge thing. 
But if you're connected spiritually, then you will stay stable amidst life's ups and downs. God doesn't promise in stormless sea, but he does provide an unsinkable ship. An unsinkable ship is the ship of devotion. And when we practice such devotion, then uh, even if the world hurts us, we'll find that God's power to heal is greater than the world's power to hurt. And that's how we move stably and successfully in our life journey. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any questions or comments? Okay, yes, please. What is the relation What is the relationship between God or spirituality and rituals? Firstly, rituals are universal. It's not just in religion. Say when we meet someone, we shake hands. That's a ritual. But rituals give structures to human interactions. When you want to when you meet someone, you want to greet, how do you do that? You shake hands. So in cricket, say for example, if a batsman hits a ball over the boundary, the umpire raises his hand like this. That's a ritual. The umpire could just symbol, symbolize six. But why raise hands like that? When there are four runs, they could just raise four fingers. Why does he move the hand like that? That's a ritual. Yeah. No, I agree with you what you're saying. It's true. But why that particular thing? You could have any other thing. If you think from a purely rational perspective, you know, this does not have any correlation with six. The six fingers would be much better correlation with six. This does not have any correlation with four. So the point here is that so there, there are ways in which we function in the world and those ways of standardized ways of functioning, they are rituals. So rituals are at one level, just standardized ways of interaction. Let me complete this answer. I'll, I'll move forward. So now, just as there are standardized ways of interacting in normal functions, in sports, in everything. Say for example, when there's a birthday. When there's a birthday, we have we build, we have a cake and then we blow the cake, blow the candle. Now why blow the candle? Actually, it's some you know, ancient Scandinavian uh, myth that actually on every birthday, some evil spirit enters into the body of the person. And if you blow a candle, then that evil spirit is blown out. So that's why the number of the age of the child, that many candles you have, they blow it out. Now, most people don't believe that. But still, that ritual is going on. So it's not that rituals are there only in religion. If you start thinking rationally, Almost every area of life is filled with activities that we do simply because they are conventional. There is no intrinsic connection between those activity and what it symbolizes or what it means. But that, con that connection is through convention. So at one level, when we want to approach God, there are certain practices which are given in the various theistic traditions for connecting with God. Say for example, right now if I put my foot over here and I point the legs to all of you and I sit like this and then I say I am feeling very humble now. <laughs> <laughs> now the very posture is a bossy posture. You could say it's possible to feel humble but it's, it's unlikely. So there are certain externals which facilitate certain internal emotions. So when we come to the uh, come to the temple and then we fold our hands in front of God, we bow down to God. These are externals which are meant to promote certain internals, and that way the internal so the rituals are meant to express the spiritual, and they are meant to experience the spiritual. That's why if you have spirit plus ritual then it becomes spiritual. If it's just a ritual done without the spirit, sometimes a person might be conspiring against another person. I think the next opportunity, I'm going to stab you in your back. But when they meet, they shake hands warmly. 
fair, that's hypocrisy. So what happens? If there is no spirit in the ritual, there is no warmth in the handshake, then it's hypocrisy. But similarly, if the rituals are done without any spirit, without any either experience of spiritual reality or any desire to experience spiritual reality, then that becomes a ritual which is devoid of spirit. And then that becomes meaningless. That can even become hypocritical. But when the rituals are done properly with the desire, with the with the appropriate spirit, then the rituals become pathways by which we connect with God. And there can be different traditions in the world which may have different rituals. Because this is, in some countries we shake hands. In some countries we fold hands. In some countries people rub their noses against each other when they are greeting each other. <laughs> different people have different traditions like that. But the point is it's a greeting. So in the Dharmic tradition we fold our hands. In maybe in the Christian tradition they have to do mass. In, in the Islamic tradition they raise their hands for the mass. These are the rituals may be different specifics in terms of the specifics, but their purpose is to connect with God. So, yeah. So the rituals are means by which we can connect with the divine. Okay, that's yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. I, yeah, I got your question. I got your question. See, is there a one particular is there one particular way to cook? a long question. Let me answer what you have spoken till now. Let me answer your spoken till now. Otherwise, we will not be able to address the issues. There are many issues. Let me first address the point of diversity of rituals and then we will go to specific diversities later if we get the time. So, can different people have different rituals and is, or is there one ritual that everyone has to follow? No. You could and use another example to understand this. So, there is a top of a mountain and there is a bottom of a mountain. Now, there could be different paths up the mountain. It's not that everyone has to take the same path up the mountain. So, but that doesn't mean every path is a path up the mountain. Some paths may be just going round and round the mountain. Some paths may be going down in the valley into the mountain. Down into the valley away from the mountain also. So, we all should be open-minded. But we can't be so open-minded that our brains fall out. What does that mean? That means there have to be some objective criteria. If I am saying that, okay, this is my, the path I am going to take about, up the mountain. And what is the test that this is a path up the mountain? Broadly two things. If I'm if that path is really taking me up to the mountain, then my distance from the top of the mountain should be decreasing. And my height from the bottom of the mountain should be increasing. Bottom of the mountain should be increasing. So similarly, if we are following a certain set of 
rituals practices see this is my path see any spiritual path should lead to two things one is increased attachment to the spiritual and decreased attachment to the material bhakti pareshanubhav viraktir anyatra cha the bhagavad purana says that bhakti how does one anyone know that somebody there is the actual authentic bhakti over there bhakti leads to para isha anubhav the experience of that divine who cannot be experienced in any other way is para and that anubhav that experience is so fulfilling so enriching that one stops craving for other things viraktir anyatra cha so we have to see that whatever practices i am following are they increasing my attachment to the divine and are they decrease uh, are they increasing my or uh, are decreasing my attachment to the worldly things if that is happening then that's it's a progressive spiritual path so that there can be many different paths but it's not that anything that anybody is doing in the name of ritual that is necessarily spiritual there can be rituals which can which are conducive to spirituality and there can be many different rituals like that but that doesn't necessarily be they have to have their objective test is it increasing my spiritual attraction is it decreasing my material attachment and if that is happening then we are definitely the rituals are are taking us on the progressive path now beyond that if you consider specifics there are <coughs> as i talked about there are different levels of access to god provided in the dharmic traditions uh, that idea is if you cannot connect at this level connect at this level if you cannot connect at this level connect at this level so in general whenever anybody is practicing something they need to feel that this is worthwhile this is good to do so with any set of rituals that are practiced there is a certain set of sanctity there is a certain sense of sanctity associated with them and that is what inspires people to do it so let's uh, i'll explain the example suppose there is a community of alcoholics everybody is drinking constantly and then one of them decides that i'm going to control myself so i will drink only once a week now in that community of alcoholics a person who drinks once a week will be considered to be a saint who is so much self control he drink only once a week now and definitely that's good as compared to where they are it's very good to come up to that level now oh, if somebody wants to, to become completely sober and say hey, why once a week just give it up so there are different levels but for somebody who for somebody who is drinking constantly if they say oh i have given up all drinking yes they say this person is of some other category only i can never be like this i don't even want to be like this so there's a bridge in between so the idea is it similarly for connecting with god if you consider at a practical level it's uh, easy to infer that all living beings have life many people keep fish in their aquariums and fish have life so if god is the source of all life then killing life just for the satisfaction of our palate of our tongue that is is questionable at the very least let me complete this one let me complete my thought of thought that in general we all wouldn't like to cause pain to anyone if you are walking on a path and it's crowded and we accidentally put our foot on someone's foot and then we realize oh i'm sorry we'll apologize sometimes it's just unavoidable because there's so much crowd but we won't intentionally put our foot on someone unless we are evil so we in general a civilized way to live is to cause as less pain as possible so similarly a uh, spiritually cultured way of living is to cause as less pain as possible so that means if we can live without killing other creatures of god that is a 
that is a spiritually a more harmonious way of living. Now, this may not be possible for everyone. And when it is not possible for everyone, there is a facility given. Now, if you look at the if you look at the tradition, whether it is Kali or any other uh, tradition, there is always yes, you can offer this to Kali and then you can take it. But there is some regulation over there. There is some, the idea is that don't do this indiscriminately, do it in a regulated way. And by that, even that regulation is a step up from indiscriminate indulgence. See, if, there are, uh, if a parent has two children and one of them is barely passes the exam, gets 40% marks. And another one is very good, gets 80% marks. And today both of them have got their results. And both of them have got 60%. And the first child comes up and the parents will say, Shabash, well done. And the second child comes and the parents say, Badmash, what have you done? Both of them have got 60%. But why appreciation for one and condemnation for the other? Because their level is different. For the 40% to go to 60% is much is a progress. For the 80% to come down to 60% is regression. So similarly, say for somebody who is completely indis doing indiscriminate indulgence, for them to do regulated indulgence within the practice within the premise of some religious rituals, that is a step up. For somebody who is capable of just giving up that indulgence. For them to come down to that indulgence, that's unnecessary. It's unhealthy. So there is a progression and there is a place for everyone in this progression. So wherever we are at, there is a place for us and from there we can move forward. Now, if we start claiming that this is the place where see, we, are, we are all Mama Vartamana Vartante Manusha Partha Sarvesha. The Bhagavad Gita Krishna says, everyone is on my path. So it's like everyone is on the mountain, somewhere on the path of the mountain. The key thing is that we don't, this is the place where I am and this is the place where I'll stay forever. So wherever we are, we progress from that. We small steps forward. That's how we'll get to the top of the mountain. So if we are at the 60% level and there are people at 40%, we are much better than them. So for somebody who is doing religious rituals, is that person maybe in many ways better than the person who is completely godless. But from somebody is 60% and they say, this is my rituals and this is how I'll stay, then they will not go from 60% to 80%. So if we have, if we understand the spirit of the rituals, then we will understand where the rituals that I am practicing are placed in the overall progression. And then we can take incremental steps forward. But if we start thinking these rituals in themselves are all that I need to do, then what is happening? We are divorcing the rituals from the overall context within which those rituals are. And then we will see stay stuck over there. So what is a pro, what is progress for one person could be regress for another person. And every a lot depends on context. The idea is that nobody should be looked down upon or demeaned. Just because somebody is at 40% doesn't mean that they have to be frowned. If that somebody is at 40%, appreciate their 40% and move forward from there. So gradually, everybody is on the spiritually progressive path. It's not that simple. It's, it's not that simple. See, it's our spiritual level is not determined by just... I get your question. Is our spirituality related with what rituals we follow or what we eat? See, there is there are our consciousness is affected by many things. And the food that we eat is one among them. Now it could be that somebody, because of their culture, might be eating meat, but they might be very spiritually involved. And somebody, because of their culture, might not be eating meat, but they might be completely materialistic. So it's not that just 
the particular ritual is the sole determiner. But each of these practices contributes. The kind of food that we eat that matters, the kind of people we associate with matters, the kind of overall lifestyle that we have matters. So all of these contribute. So it's not that just one ritual determines the whole consciousness, but all of them contribute. In general, the food we eat does shape our consciousness. And the, the food that we eat, it's not just simple physical nutrition that we get right. It is also, there, is, there are subtler energies that are passed on through that food. Nowadays, with the science, we can easily make uh, an almost 100% replica of mother's milk. But be, it has been well docu documented that babies who are not fed by their mother, but they are fed simply mother's milk, the equivalent of mother's milk. So they don't, they don't grow up as well as those babies who are well fed the mother. So in terms of physical nutrition, you could say that the chemically manufactured, the artificial manufactured milk, it's the same. But when a mother is feeding the baby, it is not just the physical nutrition. That the mother's affection is there, that the physical contact is there, the mother's care is there. So the food that we eat is not just a matter of physical nutrition. There are many other energies that are passed through that food. So when we eat meat, basically the animals who are killed at that time, whether it is whatever animals, there is fear and there is anger. Fear that I'm going to die, anger. Who is this? Why am I being killed like this? And those energies at a certain level are stored over there. And they get passed on into our consciousness and they affect our subtle energies. So that's why it's, we can't just say that because somebody is doing a particular ritual, that is the level. And somebody is doing another ritual, that's the higher level. No. But the, the, one's consciousness is determined by many factors. But we can't go to the other, uh, another extreme and say that whatever practices we are doing, it doesn't matter at all. The food we eat also affects our consciousness. So we have to look at specific practices and we have to look at how specific practices are affecting our consciousness. And then according to our situation, we take steps forward. Okay. You have a few more minutes for questions? You're asking for a long time? Yeah, sure. Um, so, how do we uh, do our day to day activities in a mode of service to Krishna? Like, say, for example, like I have to complete a project. At the at lowest level, I'm asking a simple question. So, how do we do that as a service to Krishna? Okay. So, how do we do our works, just completing a project as a service to Krishna? Broadly, this is in three, three broad ways. It is just like, say, if you are working in your office, then externally speaking, you're not at your home. Sometimes you may be far away from your home in a different city, in a different continent also. But then, you know, you're doing this for your family, for your, for your family, for your children, for your uh, wife. And you want to take care of them. You want to be responsible for them. So, it is the purpose of our action is determined not by the location of our body, but by the location of our heart. So, if we do some regular sadhana, say we do japa, do some swadhyaya, do some satsang, do some puja, then by all these, our heart gets connected with Krishna. And we understand that, yes, I have many goals in my life, but our ultimate goal is Krishna. Now, that is not just a theoretical conception. There has to be some spiritual experience that guide, that that reinforces the theoretical conception. That's where our daily spiritual practices come into the picture. So if we have some time for regular sadhana, regular spiritual practices, then that establishes a connection with Krishna in our consciousness. And then whatever the specifics we do, our life is oriented toward Krishna and then everything within our life becomes gradually oriented toward Krishna. That's the first thing. That we have a spiritual connection by which Krishna becomes our ultimate purpose in life. Then secondly, when we are doing our work, we all uh, use our abilities, our resources. And if you think deeply, 
it's not that we created those abilities our abilities are gifts from god to us paurusham rishi krishna says so in many ways people who become successful you could say they are they are successful not just because of their hard work but they are successful because they were winners of a genetic lottery some people are born with a high iq some people are born with a low iq and people most in general iq is not the sole factor but if there is extremely low iq people can't even function normally so those of us who are successful we were given certain abilities and we didn't really make those abilities we just got them so the resources that enable us to do things if you understand that they are coming from god and that itself is one level of god consciousness so what we are is god's gift to us what we become is our gift to god so while doing our work we try to keep that awareness the ability to do this is also coming from god and then beyond that one when we get the results of our work we offer those results to god that means uh, we in, in our heart we understand that everything is meant for god practically we need to give some charity the idea of charity is that if we want to give our heart to god but our heart is filled with so many things in the world so what we do is if we can't give our heart to god we give what is in our heart to god and what has a prominent place in our heart is money so when we give some charity by by when we give what is in our heart to god we give god a place in our heart and that way so by our spiritual sadhana by our awareness that our abilities come from god and by giving a portion of what we are working or the results of our work to god we can spiritual we can spiritualize our work okay thank you so thank you very much for your attention and participation hare krishna hare krishna this is the